Hello and um, welcome to uh, Notcast 189. It's been a very long time since I've talked about this band and since today is the 22nd of March 2022 we are now at the midpoint between two anniversaries in the calendar of a band I love, Suede. Uh, they are on the 24th of March 2010 the uh, the reunion show at the Royal Albert Hall, the, the show that brought the band back together and on the 18th of March 2013, the release of Suede's sixth studio album, Blood Sports. I'm going to go chronologically through these. I have no idea how long I'm going to take. So I may not even get to Blood Sports, which is a shame because I have lots to talk about with that. I think I rate it very, very highly. Uh, but in the meantime, let us talk through what's happened since the last time I, I spoke about Suede and Brett, which was surprisingly, I think, about nine months ago. Um, so 2010 setting the scene. Uh, Brett is an established solo artist of more selective appeal, as Spinal Tap would have it, as opposed to his days when he was in Suede, and just uh, coming off the back of his third album, and uh, just, just preparing and recording his fourth solo record. And I think somewhere in, in London, a phone rang in, in maybe December 2009 or January 2010, and uh, Roger Dolphy was on the other end of it, and the question was, would Swain reform to play the Royal Albert Hall at the Teenage Cancer Trust shows in 2010? And I don't know if there'd been any serious conversations or offers previously uh, around that. Presumably there'd always been that kind of, you know, inquiring kind of, would you maybe, how much would it be kind of question? Uh, but uh, though this time round, serious question, serious offer. And I think that... Um, Brett felt that it was the right time. And I think we need to go back a little bit to 2003 and, and talk about the, the end of the band coming on the heels of the, the singles album and that last final show at the London Astoria on, I think, the 14th of December or 13th of December 2003. It always felt to me that, I think, for historically, um, Suede had, had always been written out of history. You know, the question was always, oh, did you like Blur or did you like Oasis? And it's like, well, Suede and Pulp, thanks. They, they're the best two. Um, and whereas Pulp had been, I think, rehabilitated by the fact that Jarvis Cocker was a, a loquacious and endlessly quotable interviewee, um, Brett was less obviously a, a rock star off stage. Uh, and not to say that he isn't you know, a great interviewee, it's just he's less obviously a media figure. He doesn't play certain games and doesn't appear on certain shows. And so I think Swade had been written out of history as, as kind of like, you know, maybe, you know, the forerunners of placebo or something equally um, undeserving of their, their brilliance at the time and their capabilities. And I, I always felt certainly that Swade had been written out of history. Some other bands, um, which I, I think really, really highly of, bands like you know, The One Stuff, for example, um, were written out of history at the same time. And people have just kind of forgotten it as a thing that happened. And they kind of go, mm, yeah, a bit embarrassing that, isn't it? Which is, I think, really, really unfair to both how good those bands were and how important those bands were. When somebody titled the book, this band could change your life. Suede changed my life. There is no two ways about it. You know, without Suede's existence, I wouldn't be in this house. I wouldn't be married to the person that I am. I wouldn't have the son that I have, I wouldn't have the personal life that I've got, I would probably live hundreds of miles away in a very different world. And, you know, the decision by myself and my partner to, to both like Sway, we met at a Sway gig. You know, it's those type of things. That's what changed my life. And the fact that that band were written out of history, to me, feels a little bit unfair. So when, when the, uh, you know, the, the call came, March 2010 would Sway play the Teenage Cancer Trust show at the Royal Albert Hall I think I think Brett felt that the time was right to do it uh, and some calls were made and obviously some people in their minds the only version of Sway that exists is the version with Bernard Butler but you see the version um, after Bernard left the group is the version of the band that lasted longest it's the band that made the, the most music it's the lineup which people kind of when that when they saw Sway, you know, not that many people now have active memories of seeing, you know, Bernard in Suede. And so for, for many people reforming Suede was we pick up the story where we left off. And obviously the reunion with Bernard for the tears hadn't worked. 
And so the, the phone call had to be to Richard and go, would you play in suede again? And I think there was some resistance around that. It had to be done for the right reasons. It couldn't be done just for money and it couldn't be done just for ego. It had to be done because it was the right thing to do. And it had to be treated with the the lack of respect that it deserved. You know, is to say we're doing it for the right reasons, not just because someone's throwing some money at us. We're doing it because this is what we want to do. We want to, you know, reclaim the memory and the legacy of the band, which have been written out of history. Um, and after, I think, some conversations and some assurances, um, you know, the, the, the lineup of the band um, was, was confirmed to be Brett, Matt, Simon, Richard and Neil. And they were going to play a one-off show at the Teenage Cancer Trust at the Royal Albert Hall on the 24th of March 2010. Um, there were two smaller shows that the band played. I didn't get to those. The 100 Club, I think, was a competition winner's show. I didn't get to that, which annoyed me. And then there was the um, the Manchester show um, uh, the day after, um, which was a, you know, a warm-up show. And then the show itself at the Royal Albert Hall, 24th of March uh, 2010. And it had been six years, four months, 11 days and two hours since the last previous suede show that I'd seen. Uh, and we were in the, um, the standing section at the bottom. You can see me playing air guitar at the beginning of Animal Nitrate on the DVD release of the Albert Hall. If you know where to look, I'm not going to tell you where to look. It's kind of embarrassing. But at the same point, it was the way in which all reunions should happen for the right reasons with the right people. Not just motivated by money, uh, but by a, you know, a desire to reclaim and rebuild upon the band's legacy and to do things the right way. And it's widely regarded by many people as the best way gig of all time. You know, some bands, they think about, when you think about Pink Floyd, for example, live, you think about the reunion show at Live Aid, you think about Suede's defining live moment, it is the show at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, and at the time that we were there and we were experiencing it, and it was like, greeting an old friend that you hadn't seen for years often many other friends were in the crowd and and kind of going oh my god you know you've barely changed i don't know what you've done with your hair or in my case not hair but uh you know, everything had changed and nothing had changed with those songs being played again firstly i think the timelessness of the songs came through in the shows uh, and that would be you know the way in which we would connect to both the memories that we had made and the lives that we had lived but also who we were now and where we were now and how the songs had grown and got new meanings over time this was one of suede's very very best gigs it's all of course on youtube now uh, you can watch it for nothing on the band's youtube uh, channel but it really really was uh, an incredible experience actually to see a band literally reborn in front of your very very eyes uh, something that i wasn't expecting to have happen at all so the the albert hall show was notable for two things one for me one for the band and that was at the end of i think metal mickey there was a standing ovation the type of thing i've not seen at a show ever really before is that there was this enormous kind of just wave of applause. And it wasn't like, you know, the standard applause that you get at the end of a song when you go, oh, very nice, very good, very good. You know, everyone's clapping, but they're kind of going, that's fantastic. No, this was a moment where suddenly like, the whole audience in the in the Royal Albert Hall kind of just collectively just went, welcome back. And there was this wonderful moment. It's only a minute and 17 seconds on the DVD. Here's the DVD that was released on the 24th of March, 2012. But uh, it's only, you know, two minutes on, uh, on the DVD. But it is, you know, the moment where you saw the band reborn um, is that there was a standing ovation and everyone just poured love at the stage as if to go, we really missed you guys. We're really glad you're back. And it's not something I've ever experienced at a show. Uh, nothing like that ever before, actually. Um, but it was a wonderful moment. Now, of course, I, I was completely oblivious to that um, because I, in the... In the heat of the moment, it felt right to ask my partner, who I'd known for 14 years, to marry me because we had met at the Suede Show. Um, and they said yes. So whilst everyone else was doing the standing ovation, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get married to this this wonderful person um, who has you know, changed my life and, and made my world a better place completely. And so it was a wonderful experience. Uh, and of course, my experience of that is completely unique. 
I don't think anybody else got engaged at the show. Maybe they did. If they did, they haven't told everyone about it, and I have. Uh, but it was um, a, yeah, a, a moment. It really was. And I was oblivious to the whole thing. And then they played the song, The Wild Ones. And The Wild Ones is, uh, if you, you know, it, it's amongst their better songs. It's fair to say, I think they're, all their songs are really good. Uh, apart from Cool Thing, which is on the B-side of Obsession. So that, not so good. But it's Cool Thing on Positivity. I don't know anymore. But it was really a moment where you suddenly go, wow, that was a moment. And that's, that's I think, the moment maybe during the um, the ovation there, which became, you know, a defining image of, of Swade's career um, and Swade's existence. Um, it's on the cover of the, uh, the Greatest Hits selection compilation, um, which came out last year, no, in 2020, uh, when the band couldn't tour. And it's a moment which really kind of defined the band's existence uh, as, as like a moment, one of those things where, you, you know, you had to be there. Um, it was a wonderful show. And at the end of the show, um, I think as they came off, uh, I think Brett said, we've got to do this again. It's too good not to do it again. And unlike a, a number of, of, of other bands, Swade's Reformation is a thing where they have done things absolutely right and correct. They've got the right lineup, they've got the right creativity around it, and they haven't become a nostalgia act. So even though they have played some of the albums in full, um, they have released three studio albums in the past nine years. And I'm being heckled by a cat, so I'm going to have to open the uh, the door. Hang on a second. Of course, and as I said before, you know, if Swade changed my life, I wouldn't have the cats that I have, I wouldn't have the life that I have. I wouldn't wake up where I wake up every day. I wouldn't have the experiences I have without Swade and without this this band and without this moment, this experience. Um, so the Royal Albert Hall, by the way, is... Dude, the door's open. Come in. I don't understand what he's moaning about, really. I think the thing with cats is that if you've got a door that's shut, they automatically want to get in, no matter what it is that you're doing. Um, and he'll still be moaning at me for a little while longer. But the reunion was absolutely the right thing to happen. It happened for the right reasons, the right people were there. And um, I've seen some reunion shows where I've been like, not really the band, is it? I saw the Happy Mondays in 2004 that was atrocious. Um, and I think it was only the drummer and Sean Ryder and Bez. So, you know, out of the band itself, nobody in the band apart from the drummer was was really the same person and it was kind of what like watching i don't know bill ward's black sabbath experience or something it was a terrible terrible show that was obviously done for ego and money whereas i think suede never to me felt like they had a proper ending you know they did they kind of collapsed really like a, a fighter which had been beaten um on, on the corners and, and got knocked out in a in a, in a fight Swade never came out of it at the end with the glory, quitting at the right time in the right way. And it was a shame. It really was. I thought the band deserved better in 2003 than the world that they were living in at that point. But luckily, we had this, this glorious rebirth. And not only was it a glorious rebirth, it was an opportunity for the band to start again, reclaim the legacy because they'd been written out of history, and to do things the right way and to be now regarded as you know what they always were they're an incredibly important man in the 90s um, and and the early noughties to a lot of people and for them to actually not no longer be seen as you know that band that sits in your record collection in between uh you know the smiths and the stone roses and uh the the or anything like that it was like no suede deserved to be regarded for what they were which was an incredibly important band that for a period of time were able to encapsulate in their work what it was like to be alive in Britain in the early 90s and, and continue to do so. And they made a couple of great albums um, after Bernard left with Richard coming up and head music, I think, very, very highly of. But they did um, what I regard to be effectively their, their, their third debut record, released on the 18th of March 2013. This is my favourite suede album, Blood Sports. Now, some of you will go, that's that's crazy and bonkers and wrong. Well, no, it isn't. Bloodsports is a reunion album, but it's not a reunion in the standard way of being reformed like processed ham with 70% added water. You know, it's the, the lineup of the band that made the band's most commercially successful albums, um, Richard, Neil, Brett, Matt and Simon. 
um, and they came back, which was something that felt like a natural continuation and evolution of the band into another phase. Uh, a lot of reunion albums are just clearly retold solo songs written by various members of the band that they then kind of shoved into a box and made a bit like the Pixies or whoever. This is and was a reunion done correctly. This is one of the this is you know the third debut album by Swade, but also it's the best single reunion album I have ever heard. You know, it's better than ones by the Pixies. It's better than the ones by other bands I won't name. Um, it felt like the band had never actually been away. When you listen to this and you go, this is the band that made coming up and head music and a new morning and you know most of, of Dog Band Star and most of the band that made Swade. This is that same band, but they're older and they're wiser and they're more mature and they've evolved and they've become a better band and they've grown into themselves. You know, they've grown old. So they're still recognisably the same person, but they're you know, just taking some of the edges off some of, some, some of their work. So, yeah, they they um, they toured a lot in 2010, uh, 2011, 2012, before the Blood Sports album was recorded, and you know on the they released on the 24th of March 2012 the uh, Live at the Royal Albert Hall CD and DVD uh, box book set, uh, which I think was about forty pounds, which was a lot of money, but it um, but it was a you know self funded project, and the band needed to make money for it themselves. They followed up the Albert Hall show with two shows in, in one in Denmark and one in Norway, then a show at the the Bush Hall in, in London, which was the smallest suede show I had been to since the ICA in two thousand and three. And the Bush Hall show in two thousand ten really, really felt like um the early years. So when I, I saw the band before the Suede album had been released, playing to, you know, four hundred people at a university debating hall. Um the Bush Hall show felt very, very similar to that. Um, when those early shows in 1992, there was like a, a wave of, of euphoria of at last the, some band is talking to me about my life. And I remember in 1992, uh, Nirvana were very, very popular. And there weren't that many bands that were really talking about what it's like to be, you know, broke and unhappy and ambitious uh, in, in 1992. There, not many bands were doing that. And Suede were one of those bands that did that. And they captured that moment, that sense of what it was like to have been under, you know, I think 12, 13 years of conservative rule with another five years yet to go. Um, and, and being sidelined, you know, we are the, you know, the trash, the litter on the breeze um, that was in those. And the Bush Hall show really felt like the same kind of feeling to me. It really reminded me of those early shows in 1992. Um, and it was it was a great show, um, I, and they released a, a best of, um, probably called the best of Suede, which I didn't buy. Um, there is a version of the best of Suede, by the way, which has a mastering error, and they use the wrong version of Trash with a re-recorded vocal from two thousand and three on. Um, but uh, also, um, they then followed it up with some touring, and uh, the last show of uh, the last public show of two thousand and ten um, was at the O2 Arena in London. It was half sold. And therefore half empty. Uh, it's a huge show. Probably my least favourite suede show actually, um, because you know they're they're there playing the next life, and now I'm going. That's the song I'm going to be buried to, and the fuckwit behind me is talking about how they got to take that tickets that morning. And I'm like, just fucking shut up and let people enjoy the show. You know, just because this isn't a song that you know doesn't mean it's a song that doesn't mean anything to anybody. Um, but I thought that the O2 show was, was perhaps uh, too big. The sound was pretty crap because the sound is often pretty crap at the O2. Um, and the performance suffered a little bit from nerves. Um, I then saw, I, I, they, they did some reissues in 2011, uh, multi-disc versions of the albums. Um, I, and they played some shows. They played the first three albums in Fuller, Brixton and Dublin's Olympia. I didn't go to those due to a combination of um, money and uh, my heart really I just didn't feel it I didn't feel that I wanted to do that really uh, and then we had some extra shows that came back uh, so the band played um, some shows in Russia in December I think 2011 uh, they played I think St Petersburg and Moscow and um, that was where we heard the first fruits of the writing sessions that would become the Blood Sports album now I think of those songs that they played, only two of them have been released. 
Uh, one is Sabotage on Blood Sports, another one is Falling Planes, which was one of the B-sides during the Blood Sports period. There was also songs uh, The Only, which they played twice, which I think is my favourite of the songs which haven't been released. Uh, Someone Better, I Don't Know Why, um, Future Nightmare and Cold War. Now those songs um, were the sound of suede learning to be swayed again, learning to write again. And if you haven't written a song for a long period of time, inevitably you, there's going to be some period of learning how to do it. You know, in the way that, I don't know, if you had sex for a very long period of time, and you kind of go, am I doing this right? I'm kind of rusty. You know, it's the same kind of thing. So I kind of think of those songs as kind of like warm-up songs really they're good songs they're not amazing songs um, i wish they'd been recorded and i wish they'd been issued on b-sides uh, but we still got eight b-sides out of the blood sports period so it's not as if we were short of, of songs around there and the first release um, from from the blood sports album was a, a download only track uh, which was later released as a seven inch single for record store day 2013 here is the uh, the seven inch it is Barriers, uh, first song off the album. And the seven inch that was released for Record Store Day is back with Barriers on one side and Animal Nitrate on the other. Effectively, it's a double A uh, with the 20th anniversary of Animal Nitrate. I would have preferred an unreleased song on that seven inch uh, as opposed to, to Barriers and Animal Nitrate. I didn't like the idea of, of having two lineups doing the A and B sides and one being a very old single which was you know very well known. Barriers is one of my very very favourite um, suede songs. In fact I go so far as to say it's probably my favourite song off Blood Sports. I've only seen them play it live once which is a great great shame uh, but it's just this fantastic song with this lovely intricate lyric. And um, Blood Sports as an album by the way is, is one of my favourite albums of all time. This is a an album that to me it's not a concept album but it's an album which has a theme all the songs are around a mature kind of worldview but they're also around a story and if you follow the lyric of the of the album as it goes through it's really telling a story about the beginning and ending of a relationship as you know a mature adult and what it is to be when you're you know clearly no longer a teenager um, and navigating the, the treacherous seas of adulthood and relationships and blood sports is even from the you know the, the, the cover image there it, it clearly sets itself as being a song about what could be a battle in terms of a relationship between two people and sometimes and, you know, two people together can be just the two of us tearing each other apart. And other times it can be this, this you know, wonderful combination, which is more than the sum of the parts. So let's let's go through the album. I've already mentioned Barriers, which I think is one of my, my very favourite uh, songs on the album. Uh, and it's a concept album really about falling in love as an adult, although I suspect nobody's ever quite articulated it quite in those ways. And uh, Barriers is, is a really, really important song to me. Um, there's this wonderful kind of approach in the lyric. It's about, you know, when you're British, people think that you're repressed. They think you're not very good at accessing emotions. There's that, that you know, cliche about the stiff upper lip and everything that goes with it. Uh, but I think that, you know, barriers is around that moment when perhaps when you start being a couple and there is a moment when you kind of go, I'm going to have to go out there. I'm going to have to put myself out of my comfort zone and risk something. I'm going to risk the fear of rejection. I'm going to put myself out there and, and, you know, I don't know if someone's going to take it. Um, and it's, it's around that, that kind of that sense of that fear, that repression, but also the courage that goes with it. You jump over the barriers that people put up, the walls that people put around themselves uh, to go into it. And, and you know, you've, you've then got this fabulous, fabulous song that opens uh, the album. Um, so this is the... The box set version of the album. The album was released in a number of configurations, I should point out, by the way, with a total of eight different bonus tracks across various versions. Uh, so the, the iTunes and the Australian CD had uh, extra tracks in the form of Dawn Chorus and Howl. The Japanese version had uh, Dawn Chorus and Nothing Can Stop Us. The box set had Dawn Chorus and Nothing Can Stop Us as well. Um, and then there were B-sides of on the Hit Me single, which were Violet Says and Falling Planes, and on uh, For the Strangers, the B-sides were Darkest Days and Human Tide. So there's lots of extra songs um, that were going around, but this is the you know one of the versions of it, the box set version that comes with a 180 gram, uh, no, 140 gram LP uh, there. Um, 
and then you have uh, kind of like a very lavish illustrated booklet here um, then you've got uh, in here you've got a CD of Blood Sports but you also got a 7 inch single and this 7 inch single features No Holding Back and Dawn Chorus, Dawn Chorus is the song that the band clearly really really liked out of the sessions for the LP and you get uh, in, in here you get uh, quite a extensive lyric book uh, that goes with it. There was also um, a, uh, a Japanese CD and DVD. Here it is. This version features those two bonus tracks and it also features a DVD of the, the songs. But Blood Sports to me is you know, one of the e easily my favourite and I think my most important trade album. Because at the time that this album came out, which was as I said March 2013, I was fast approaching a certain birthday, um, and I was you know, clearly no longer a young dude, um, and I was kind of staring at the crossroads of, well, what happens when you get to that age? You can't be young anymore. The things which I had done when I was in my 20s, you know, going out, staying out, staying late, staying out until the next morning, those type of things, those were things I couldn't do anymore, um, not only because I'm too old for that stuff, but also because the body doesn't recover from it, um, and I was also having a bit of, I think, a crisis of faith and hope in my life I was kind of having I mean not a midlife crisis as such but I was examining parts of my life and going is this is the job that I'm doing is that the right thing to do you know is the world that I've built the right one for me and for the right one for the people that are in it am I the right person am I a person that I can be you know proud of or happy of or or like and, and yet what blood sports did in fact it really was the soundtrack to that, that period of time in my life when I faltered a little and I, I kind of went okay am I who am I going to be as a grown -up? what am I going to be what am I going to believe how am I going to be and you know is my job the right thing all that type of stuff um, and with Swade kind of coming back and, and doing this this album they, they kind of said you can still take all the things about you that were good when you were younger and you can take those and you can convert those into you know life as as an adult and you can take those concepts and those ideas forward and you can still be who you are um, and you know you can still maintain your integrity you know you don't have to get into golf and cars or whatever you can still be into bands and music and all that stuff um, and, and blood sports is an album that to me was re really important in soundtracking that period of my life when I wanted to, to just take my life out and examine what it was and make sure it was still the one that I wanted to be, you know. And, yeah, eh? and as um, kind of getting older, you kind of think, well, you know, are these the right things? And they absolutely are, absolutely were. A fantastic LP, I would recommend strongly that, you know, you go and buy it, of course. Um, there was a coloured vinyl version of Blood Sports. That's in the, uh, the 2016 uh, Studio Albums collection, uh, which was a uh, 1,000 copies limited edition on Amazon in a lovely blood red colour. Uh, these these coloured vinyl versions, I think, um, you know, sometimes I think that, you know, coloured vinyl is God's way of telling you that you've got too much money. Uh, but of course, if you don't buy every colour of it, then you're probably making the right decision there um, second track on the album is Snowblind and Snowblind is um, I think a very underrated song um, I wish the band played it like in fact I wish the band played all the songs off this album more often I think they're, they're um, fantastic songs and very underrated uh, but uh, it's yeah the, the, an ideal combat record so we've got on uh, Snowblind we have um, a lyric which is uh, yeah, um, around, uh, I think Brett mentions, I think it was the Aniseed Kisses again, but you know, it's around that, that idea of that intersection between two people and the place where, where two people meet and somehow become more than the, um, the individual component parts. There's a multiplication, not an addition there. So it's two times two, or more pro you know, three times three, as opposed to three plus three, if that makes sense. And uh, the the lead single from the album, the lead official single from the album, is it starts and ends with you, and it starts and ends with you is is the song that the band play live the most off Bloodsports to this day. Um, it's a classic 
song. It sounds like Suede from 1993, but 20 years older and 20 years wiser. Um, they're still the same people. They're, they've just, they've, you know, they've grown up a little. They've evolved a little. This is the next stage where, where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And it's um, got a wonderful lyric around, I fall to the floor like my strings are cut. And uh, there's a, you know, the world spins and you can't get up. And, and there's a, a sense of, you know, how in terms of identity, you may want to form your identity around, you know, it starts and ends with you and who you are. Because remember, we're not a job. We're not, unless, you, unless, you like, unless you've got your priorities a little bit different to lots of people, you aren't your job. You aren't your car keys, you aren't your Ikea uh, bookshelves. You know, you are the things outside of that. You are the relationship and the friends and the family and the people that you've got in your life. And with it starts and ends with you, that's kind of saying, well, actually, you are you know, the bedrock, the foundation of all these things. And, and bearing in mind this album, almost all of the songs are around falling in love or being in love or staying in love uh, as, you know, the relationship as the core thing that is in your life. Um, is it does it starts and ends with you and around that everything else builds around it um, track four is sabotage and, and sabotage is a song that was first played in russia in 2011 it's a kind of kind of cold icy almost detached sound it's very winter actually as a song um, but it's also a song which which is you know, again, around, you know, our love is sabotage and, and everything that goes with it. But this wonderful descending, ascending, spindly guitar riff from Richard. I mean, listen to it, guys. It's an incredible riff. Yeah. If you're a band and you come back and you're trying to force it to happen, you're trying to force a chemistry that doesn't exist, you know, the songs aren't going to be as good as this. They're not going to be as vibrant as this. This sounds like the band just picked up exactly from where they left off previously and went yeah okay so we've, we've had 10 years where we've been doing something else but this is yeah this is us this is here this is now and and this is this is what suede are so uh, the next track of uh the album is is the third single uh which is for the strangers uh, which has a here's a seven inch which was the only commercial release at the time um a commercial physical release uh, and the uh, seven inch was backed with the other single as well hit me so it was effectively a double pack seven inch of for the strangers uh backed with darkest days and then hit me backed with human tide and uh, i'm in the video for for the strangers um uh, because it was shot at the london alexandra palace i think on the 30th of march 2013 and it's backed with a track called Darkest Days, which I think I think the band played live in 2015 once at one of the Camden Roundhouse shows. And then the second single is Hit Me, uh, backed with Human Tide. Um, so there's lots and lots of extra tracks from around about this same period, uh, which are on various kind of singles. Um, and the band released uh, a box set of seven-inch singles, all of their seven-inch singles together. I think it was in early 2014. Here's the seven-inch box set, uh, which features uh, the uh, the singles from the respective albums. So let let let's go and see what we've got here. So we've got uh, there's barriers um, backed with falling planes. Falling planes being played live in Russia. Here's the uh, the seven inch for it starts and ends with you backed with dawn chorus dawn chorus on the seven inch uh, that comes with the box set version of the album. Uh, then there's the hit me backed with what Violet says so that's a different B side to the one that's on the commercial retail seven inch. And then there's uh, for the strangers backed with darkest days which is the same same track. There's also a uh, I've got a couple of the original seven inches in here film star Saturday night. Um, beautiful ones i think as well but these these singles were not commercially released you know people just weren't releasing commercial singles at these point i mean you know maybe bands were doing seven inches they were doing yeah but the cd single and multi-formatting and all that stuff was was clearly you know dead in in, in the water dead and gone so the only way to get the, the commercial uh, seven inch singles from from the album was to buy the seven inch box set if you wanted it starts and ends with you, for example. Um, and so we go over to uh, For the Strangers, which is, I think, it's a fantastic song about what happens when you've got two people and the space between two people and when they become one as a, a, an entity, I think is the way that I see it. And then we've got Hit Me, which doesn't have a great video, 
but I think anyone would tell you that. Um, and uh, I saw the last live performance of Hit Me, which was at the Ace Hotel in January 2016. And I wish the band would play it live more often, because I think all of the songs on this album are really strong, brilliant songs, actually. And Hit Me has a, a line about, you know, the, the power of love, the power of attraction, the power of romance, the power of connection between two people, with the line about, you know, hit me with your majesty, um, it, touch me, and I will, you know, come on and hit me with all your mystery. And it's around, like, well, you meet somebody, and you're like, oh, my God, there's, you know, another person. And, and sometimes it's really, really important to have another person that you could share your experiences with, good, bad, ugly, whatever they are. In, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it sounds a little bit like a single written to order, but if a single written to order sounds so good, I'm not going to complain about that at all. Um, and then there's what I regard to be my my favourite song on the album, track seven, is Sometimes I Feel I'll Float Away. And they, they last played that live in Birmingham uh, last year, and I wasn't there, and that was a shame, because I love that song. It's my one of my very favourite suede songs. Um, there's a you know the opening with the lines is all the colours of the world can't compare to the colour of your impossible eyes and I'm like wow that's that's written by somebody that really really knows what it's like to look at somebody and to just be um, just be transfixed by another human um, and you know I've, I've known that feeling it's a much wonderful feeling um, it's it's uh, you know and that song always reminds me of you know experiences I've had and and things I've been very lucky to 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 know and experience you know the look in someone's eyes and they don't know they're doing it they're just looking at stuff when you're looking there and going my god this person has you know added and expanded my knowledge of of life and everything that goes in it um and there's a there's a couple of of other lines around it you know, there's one about let me take you through every stage of the male mistake and we'll adopt our natural roles and I need you more than you need to be needed. And so I sign my will one step at a time. And it's it's kind of like going, well, you know, that's where you suddenly think that, you know, you build your foundation around an experience or a person. And it's like, you know, it starts and ends with you. And, and you know, then you go, well, it's the male mistake, isn't it? The male mistake is around... I be possibly becoming like either obsessional or, or, or um, you know, fixated on a relationship as a key part or a key component of your identity. Um, and then, I mean, I, I did that many, many years ago, decades ago. And then that relationship came to a close. And then all of a sudden it was like the central strut that was holding up the roof of everything else has been removed and everything collapses. And it's kind of like, you know, and, and then, you know, I need you more than you need to be needed. And I saw my will one step at a time. It's kind of like, going, well, I can barely function at this point now. And I have to think about how everything has collapsed around me. Um, it's, it's just such a wonderful song. And it's kind of an incredible solo. Um, I mean, sometimes I feel I'll float away. It's, it's, in my opinion, one of, one of the best Wade songs. Easily top five. Barriers is in that top five as well, by the way. Um, and if you don't know the album, please listen to it, and you'll go, oh my God, they've they've totally they've they've done it well, they've done it right. It's not like a band that have got back together. And go, well, if we do this, we'll make more money. I mean, yeah, everyone got to get paid to do their job, um, but they're doing it because it's really good. It's not just you know, there's there's a pride and there's a engagement in that work, which which still stands to this day. And I listen to this stuff and I go. That is the sound of, of a band maturing and growing into themselves, learning how to be, uh, which is, you know, wonderful. Um, there's One of You Not Telling Me, which is the next song, Song 8, which is about the mysteries of love and not for us. And this is almost like the songs are not necessarily, if you follow the, you know, the thematic approach of it, the first side is about the falling and the staying and the being. Uh, and then you know, Hit Me is, is kind of like the transitional song. And then the last four songs, Sometimes I'll, feel, I'll Float Away, What Are You Not Telling Me Always on Fault Lines, feels like there's you know, starting to be some uncertain and unsteady ground underneath the narrator as, as the songs kind of start to collapse into a description of what it's like when a relationship changes or evolves and sometimes it doesn't always go in a very positive way um, so it's a you know a really really important record and for me blood sports is the album that, that really kind of cemented the fact that this yeah um 
because it came out at a, a formative point in my life, I was at the point where I'm going, right, is everything from here downhill? Uh, is everything in my life now going to be not quite as good as it once was? Is that what my life is going to be? And, and no, you know, Blood Sports was an album that soundtrack for me, the realisation that I could still feel the amazing things that I felt when I was younger, and I can feel them as an adult, and I can experience them as an adult. Uh, I can, you know, joy and love and, and everything goes with it. And growing old doesn't have to mean just constantly standing up and going, oh, there's a new bit of me that hurts. You know, it'll be about... Yeah, you know, sometimes, yeah, you know, if you, if I'm, yeah, nearly fifty. Got to be honest about it, nearly fifty. And sometimes I get up and I'm like, there's a bit of me, and I kind of go, now is that me being nearly fifty, or is that something that's genuinely wrong with me? I'm not sure. Can't tell. Oh, that's a new part of me that's aching. Oh, yeah, now that hurts, you know. And then, but I kind of thought at the time that this album came out, I was uncertain about what it was to be growing older and what it was to be an older person, and what it was to... And then I kind of realised when I listened to this record, I go, I can still feel things with the intensity that I used to, and there's still, you know, the ability to be astounded and, and to be joyous. Um, I'd been in... Uh, I'd had a rough ride career-wise uh, for a few years before Blood Sports came out, and I was kind of thinking, um, is, is a job a thing that I'm just not destined to enjoy anymore? You know, am I not destined to, to feel amazing things and, and to feel happiness? And, you know, Blood Sports was an album that soundtrack for me, a realisation that being old didn't have to mean just constantly moaning about how things hurt and how, um, you know, how tired you are. You know, there was the ability to, to grow old in a way that was going to be exciting and, and thrilling and happy. Uh, it really was. Yeah, and in that way, it's a soundtrack to a life-changing set of experiences which I had, which helped me really adapt to, to being perhaps older than I was and waking up with the realisation that I wasn't going to be, you know, 21 forever or forever 21, uh, depending if you're an Art Magic fan. There's a legendary and fantastic, in my opinion, song which they haven't yet released called Forever 21. Or is it 21 Forever? I can never remember. Anyway, I have heard it. It's only been played live once. That's a lovely song. But no, Blood Sports is, in my opinion, um, Swade's best album for me. I know there's going to be some of you that say that Dogman Star is their best album. It's okay. We can agree to disagree, I think is the very nice way of putting it. Um, Blood Sports, I think, was at the time it came out, it was quite roundly and quite justifiably kind of criticised for a, a hostile approach to formatting. As I've said, you know, the Australian uh, CD and the iTunes had two bonus tracks. The J J Japanese version had two bonus tracks, but one of them was different. The box set had two bonus tracks, but one of those was different as well. Um, and so if you wanted to get all of the songs which were released, I think there were five songs that were released at the t uh, in various different configurations of the album. If you wanted to get them all, well, you, you had to buy the, the box set of the album and you had to buy the Japanese CD, which comes with the DVD and the two bonus tracks. You also had to buy the uh, iTunes version of it that came with the extra track, Howl. And so, you know, you had five extra songs. So I was like, just sell me one version of the album with everything in it. The fact that, you know, the box set version of the album here can only contain the 10-track CD, not the 12-track CD that was on here, didn't have the DVD that was on this, but did have a 7-inch with a song that you couldn't get anywhere else called No Holding Back. And I'm like... Fucking ridiculous, guys. It's kind of wrong, actually, and a little bit hostile to your consumers. And as I kind of said before, the band did a um, a CD singles box set and a 7-inch singles box set, which meant that you could get the eight songs that were released amongst the various formats. Let's quickly hope. Ah, no, that's Attitude. Um, but, you know, there was a, the, a CD single of Barriers that was backed with Nothing Can Stop Us and Howl. There was a CD single of Hit Me, um, and it starts and ends with You here, which has Dawn Chorus and No Holding Back on. There was Hit Me, which has Falling Planes and What Violet Says. Falling Planes, of course, being played in Russia. And then For the Strangers, which has Darkest Days and Human Tides. There was also a DVD of promotional videos, uh, which features as the last video, For the Strangers, which, of course, I was... Uh, I'm in the video for that. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to have to buy that. And I was like, that's what I'm going to have to do. Um, sadly, these, these box sets are, are quite difficult to get hold of these days and quite expensive. Um, but then 
And I think there were a limited edition of, I think, a thousand of these and a thousand of the seven-inch one as well. So, um, you know, the band were limited by the amount of commercial interest that there was. There was also two live albums that were released. Uh, recorded on the night, burnt to CDR and sold from the merch desk. Um, this one is the O2 Academy show in Leeds. Um, that is on a three disc set, so uh, two parts of the main set plus one CD with the encore on, um, which is 90 minutes. There's also this, which is the uh, the Brussels, uh, yeah, Brussels AB, brilliant venue, uh, Brussels AB, um, which features the show on two CDs. This is the slightly later repressing that has the set list on the back and features the whole of these two shows. I don't know if these shows are still available. They probably should be if they aren't already. Um, and that takes us to the end of 2013. Um, in conclusion, I think Blood Sports by Suede is my, my favourite of their albums. Um, it's an album that really spoke to me at a time that I needed music to heal me. Uh, it's an album that, that soundtracked a change in my life and a change in who I was when I realised that growing old was something that could be hopeful and beautiful and growing old would, could be a fantastic experience on its own terms as opposed to just merely a set of aches and pains and general moans and malaises. Um, and there you have it. I strongly, strongly recommend Suede's Blood Sports. Uh, it's a, it was a wonderful period to be a fan. Incredible experiences. Um, and I'm a fan to this day and for the rest of my days to come. So thank you. Take care of yourself. Um, see you all soon. Stay beautiful. Bye.